the theme of our presentation today will be on the synthesis of yogic wisdom. the ancient mystical knowledge was formulated and under formulated and presented to the world as a science of yoga yoga means that which makes you one with your divine nature. It is purely a mental science, a mental and spiritual science based on good understanding on wisdom knowledge. Therefore, we will go into its allied features in a brief manner. Now, we have used the word the synthesis. We have to synthesize various aspects of our human existence and we, have, we can broadly classify them into five categories of our human existence. First and foremost, our life should be based on knowledge and wisdom. That's the first thing. If not, one would lead one's life ignorantly, without understanding the meaning and the purpose of human existence, and also how and where and in what manner we should get stabilized in our divine nature, in our true divine nature. So this understanding is necessary. It's the first aspect. So you may call it the first component is knowledge and wisdom, without which no practice becomes effective. So therefore, that's the first thing that all spiritual aspirants <coughs> must seek, must look into, so that they are well grounded and based on a good understanding of how to live a spiritual or a yogic life which will lead to one's divine nature. Then the second aspect of this is is that we have to live life and while living life we have to go through the operations <coughs> the karmas and the actions of life which are the actions of life how to so effectively go through these actions is a second factor. So this has to be understood. How to <coughs> go through your actions and the living of life. The living of life itself is a yoga. You don't require a, a different or a distinct discipline for that purpose. The very living itself, if you know how to live life, that itself is a spiritual science of living or a yoga. That has to be understood. That's the second component. Now the third one is, it is involved with love. Love. You must have love. And love is the way not only to the divine, but to the innermost, to your own innermost nature too. Love is the way. 
So that's love has to be understood. Now in the normal religious tradition, they use the word devotion, <coughs> adoration for this part, this aspect of the emotional aspect of man. Of course, man has got his own emotions, his feelings, but love is very predominant in that. And this love has to be proper, very well comprehended in such a way that uh, that is the most important factor which will lead you to your divine nature. So that is why Jesus, was, Jesus said the two great commandments. One was love thy Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind and the heart and, and your being. That was the first commandment. And the second great commandment was love thy neighbor. Unless you love your neighbor, love neighbor means the one who is your immediate neighbor in your neighboring house, neighboring village, neighboring town, neighboring country, neighboring planet. In short, you love one and all. Unless you have this unconditional love, for one and all and for all beings, one cannot get enlightened. It's a sign called none. So you cannot afford to dislike or disregard <coughs> any human being in the world. So therefore, and he said, on these two commandments rest everything. One is to love thy Lord with all your heart. And the second is, in order to love your love the divine, you also should learn to love one and all, all beings in the whole universe. This is love. So love is a very important factor. If you have love, you have everything. If you don't have love, you have nothing. So love, because your center of your existence is love. God is love, it is used. It is said God is love. So unless you have love in your heart and you are loving in your ways, of course you cannot attain your divine nature. So therefore the third factor is, the third component is, is love. Is love. <coughs> then the fourth is you have a mind now unless you overcome this mind and make the mind into a state of no mind and do not permit this mind of yours to be a to be an obstruction and to be victimized by your own mind, you have to now overcome this mind of yours. This troublesome mind with which everyone is involved with. So this is the fourth aspect. The science of the mind has to be understood and you have got to overcome this mind of yours, what the mind is and how to do so. This is the fourth aspect. Then the first, fifth component is cultivation of divine virtues. So in this, in this process, of course, there, are, there is a thing called worldly ethics. There is also something called spiritual ethics. Which one will have to cultivate in one's life? And uh, all the scriptures of the world very clearly explain and indicate what these 
spiritual virtues are, and then they have to be cultivated by a person. So in short, when you do cultivate these virtues of life, what happens is, you become godly in nature. Godly in nature. Because you want to experience your God nature. And it is not possible to experience your godly nature unless you be godlike. You have to be godlike. So in order to be godlike, you'll have to cultivate those godlike virtues which will make you one. So you have to be saintly. You have to be saintly. There was a Swami in Rishikesh long ago, about, he passed away about 50 years ago. He was saintly in nature, saintly in all what he was. And he had another component with him which was love. Love and saintliness went along in that with that Swami there. He became fairly very well known because of these two qualities of his. Saintliness and full of love. He was full of love in his heart for one and all. So therefore these divine virtues have to be also acquired and cultivated by one and all. Now, let us go into this a little more elaborately. So the first thing is, we said you require wisdom knowledge. That's the first thing. And what is that wisdom knowledge that you should acquire, but you do not know, and until you are told so, until you are informed so, and that is that you, in your essential nature, art the divine. Art the, you are the divine. In your essential nature. Not in your human nature. In your human nature, you are very much human. But, when you understand that there is a divine divinity present within you, which is your true nature and beingness, then thereafter, all that you have to do is to understand it, appreciate it, appreciate it, and then thereafter be centered there. Thereafter be centered there. Not be ego-centered or human-centered, but just try to be centered in your divine nature and then operate in life and feel your divine nature. Feel it. So this understanding must, be, must come to you. And the scriptures very emphatically and clearly reveal and tell you that thou art the divine. If not for the pronouncement, you will not know it unless it is told to you by an authoritative source. <clears throat> the scripture is an authoritative source. And uh, it comes and informs and educates you about your divine nature. That's why it's a scripture. It educates you about your divine nature. And in, so thus it tells you, Tat tvam asi, Thou art that divine which thou seekest, with all <coughs> thy heart. With all thy heart. You seek something, but you do not know what you are seeking. But you are seeking that which is already there within you. You are really speaking, seeking yourself. So you want to know, who am I? Of course that question was, has always been there. Even the little boy asks his parents, who am I? And you tell him somewhat as to who he is. But that's not the real who am I? Who am I? Who am I? So therefore the scripture is now telling you, O oh my blessed child, thou art the divine which you have been looking for. And what is this divine? Then you may ask, what is this divine? The divine is that which is one whole, it is one, it is perfect, 
That is why it is said, God is perfect. It's a state of perfection. State, when you say use the word perfect, means it's a state of perfection. State of perfection means it's an existence in wherein you feel your perfection. You experience a perfection. What more do you want? After all, you know very well that you are in, inadequate. Inadequate. You feel there's something missing, something wanting within you. That's why you are searching to complete yourself. Everyone is trying, searching for this completion. But when you are already self-complete, then all that you have to do is to find out where it is, how it is, and to repose there. Because you're already it. You're already self-complete. You're already, by your very nature itself, in it, you are whole, you are one, non-fragmented. So there's something wondrous there within you. If that be the case, and if it is explained to you in this man manner, then everyone would be curious and may even seek for it. May even, you may even seek for it, you may want it. Who does not want this wondrous state? So therefore, this is the first understanding that you should acquire. The good knowledge. And everything follows from this. Once you have acquired this knowledge, this understanding, then thereafter, we are, when you have been told that you, thou art the divine, learn to appreciate and become comfortable with this idea. Henceforth, try to behave and act and live in a manner worthy of this, of this noble status. And feel to yourself that I am that. I am that. Aham Brahma asked me. I am that. I am that. And then keep yourself centered in your in this state. In this state, keep yourself centered. So this understanding is paramount and foremost. And the beginning of the practice of true religion begins here. So when you understand this, you will realize something very profound. And that is, to pray to whom? To pray to whom? How could you pray out thereafter? You see, when you are that itself, hmm, then you graduate from the original forms of prayers that you have. And now, thereafter, all that you do is appreciate it, <coughs> appreciate the status, and then be it itself. Just try to be it. That's all that you have to do. You cannot undertake prayers any further, but you can function in a manner, live in a manner, which is befitting this understanding, which is befitting. So I am that. I am that. So this is the basis of your initial knowledge itself. Now in order to be settled in this state, in order to be settled in this state, you have to now be centered there. Be centered there. Once you have been told that you are it itself, all that you have to do is now to repose there and be centered there. To repose there. How do you repose there? All that you have to do is to be centered. Is to be centered. Just be centered. That's all that you have to do. And for you to understand what is to be said, in what, what is being, what is it that is understood as being centered? What is it that is understood as being centered? This can be understood by knowing when you are not centered, when you are off-centered, when you are out of balance, that you know very well. Whenever you are out of balance, 
or lost your center, lost your equilibrium, then you know. Then you, then you automatically know that you have not been, you have got bal off balance, off center, and therefore what should you do? Get back to your center. Just get back to your center. When I use the word get back to your center, be in harmony, be at peace with yourself. Be at peace and be in total harmony with yourself. Then you are automatically centered. You are automatically centered. When you are upset, you are now off-centered. When you are not upset, you are centered. So simple. And when you are centered, then all that you have to be there do is be there, be centered. And if you have got something to do, do it, but being centered. And if you have got nothing to do, just be being centered. Being centered. Just be. Just exist. So this is the first thing that you have to acquire. That is why the definition for this, for this state is so beautifully indicated as samatvam yoga uchyate the state of mental equipoise the state of mental balance is said to be the state of yoga which will unite you with your divine nature that's all so you are in a state of equipoise you are in a state of equilibrium calm and serene then you are centered, you are balanced. And this is exactly what Buddha also said as the middle path. The psychological middle path wherein you are centered. Being centered, live your life. So when you are centered, you are automatically God-centered. How many centers do you have? How many centers can you have? Only one center. And since your divine nature is there, when you are centered, you are automatically God-centered. That's the whole secret about it. And as you keep on living your life being centered, you, so to say, begin to get stabilized in that state. As you get stabilized, by and by, as the expression goes, you will touch the rock bottom. When you when we use the word, you will touch the rock bottom, it means that it's at that time that you will have your divine experience as to what you are. So the living of life is an exercise. It's an exercise, a spiritual exercise to train yourself to be so centered and to be aware in this state. So therefore, now being centered, you have to do one more little thing. And that is to be aware of your divine nature. To be aware, that's all. Why should you be aware? Because you had forgotten it. Haven't you? Haven't you? In your normal life, you had forgotten it. You got distracted by the things of the world. So therefore, all that you have to do now is to be consciously aware. Consciously aware. So when you are consciously aware, you have become alive to your true beingness. You have become alive to it. So this is the first thing that you have to understand. To acquire this good knowledge. That I am that. And this is the basis of your spiritual life. This is the basis. Then thereafter, you have to now live your life. And go through your functions, your karmas. In popular language, they, people call this as karma yoga. But all that we say is that all the actions that you do in life, just do it, being centered. Whatever has to be done, 
Just do it peacefully. Just do it peacefully. When you do it peacefully, there is no hurry, there is no tension. Because a tension is what? Is a tension in your psychological state. So perform these actions without any tension, without being in a state of hurry. You know, don't be impatient about it. Patiently. Are you impatiently to are you impatient about living life? No. You should not be impatient about life, about the living of life. Patiently live your life. Patiently execute all your actions. Are you in a hurry to go anywhere? No. You are in no hurry to go anywhere at all. The more patiently, patiently you are, you train yourself to live, the quicker will you arrive at your destination. The quicker will you exit the universe. The more impatient you are, either in the living of your life or in the execution of your actions, the more will you prolong your existence. But the more patient you are, either in living or in executing your, action, your functions in life, the quicker will you exit the world. So you're in no hurry. You're in no hurry. It's the secret of living. Peacefully go about living your life. So this is the second aspect which involves action. Because actions you actions you must do, you have to do. So whatever actions are come which come your way, you just take it and execute it. Just execute it. That's all. And execute it to the best of your ability. Best of your ability. And furthermore, how should you execute it? Lovingly execute it. Lovingly execute all that has to be done. Whether it's a pleasant action or an unpleasant action, everything has to be lovingly executed. Lovingly. With that, the action is over. <clears throat> Otherwise, it will come back to you again. If an action is ill done or not done, you may have to do it again. But you don't want to do it again. You don't want to come back into this world again. You want to terminate it and exit it. In fact, in the United States, mostly on bumper stickers, they have got stickers on their bumpers, car bumpers. So somebody asked me, what would be a good bumper sticker to put on the bumpers on cars? Olden days had real bumpers in their cars had real bumpers so I said live and get out <laughs> if you know how to live you will know how to get out so that's the whole idea live why should you live because you have to live you may as well as live it <clears throat> you came here I came I saw and I conquered. You know the famous expression statement? I came. I came into this world. I saw the world. And then I conquered it. And how do you conquer it? Could you raise your hands and tell me? How could you conquer this world? Come on. How could you conquer this? Love all. Love everything. That's right. Love conquers all. Love. That is, so if you have, with love you can conquer the world. You know that man Mahatma Gandhi, he conquered the world with love. That was all, that was all the, the weapon that he had, love. Unqualified, unconditional love. And he conquered the hearts of one and all. He conquered the hearts of one and all. So therefore, all actions, everything has to be done in a very loving manner indeed. And perfectly very well. Perfectly too. Because if you don't do it perfectly, you, it has to, you have to come back to once again execute it. And whatever comes your way, 
whatever functions, whatever karmas come your way, whatever experiences come your way, happily and pleasantly experience it out. Just experience it out. And then walk away. Just walk away. <laughs> That's all. Don't stand there and linger about it. The matter is over. That experience was over. So therefore, live your life in this manner. When you can live your life being centered hmm, and peaceful and execute all that which has to be done by you and you know very well what has to be done by you. Whatever which works which come your way will have to be done by you. Just do it. And with that the matter is over. The matter is over with that. If you can live your life in this manner in a completely ex executing all what you may have to do and lovingly too, then you, become, then you are a success in the living of life. In the living of life you are a success. You're not worried about other matters. You can be a successful soccer player, cricket player, whatever it is. But here you are a success in the living of life. That's what is more important. So therefore, all karmas, all actions have to be done by you. The second component of this. Then the third component, as we said, was love. You've got to have this feeling of love towards one and all. This loving kindness. So it's a very important factor. So in order to have this love, and to develop this love within you, that is a nice Buddhist formula. Maitra, Karuna, Mutita, Upeksha. Maitra. Maitra means the feeling of friendliness. Maitra, Mitra Bhavana. So Mitra Bhavana here means the feeling of friendliness towards one and all. You're friendly. You've got a friendly nature with one and all. You know, about 120 years ago. At that time, long ago, there was a Swami who went to America. He was the second Swami who went there. Ramatirtha was his name. He knew nobody in America. He just took off, boarded the ship and went over there. Landed at the jetty, at the harbor. At that time, it was called the jetty, the harbor. And with a little suitcase, he was sat, seated on a bench, wondering what to do the next move. A gentleman came up to him, seeing the way he was seated, the gentleman came up to him and asked him, Don't you know anybody in this, in this town, in this city? And promptly came the reply, I know you. And you know what the gentleman said? Come, let's go. Come, let's go. That was all. So here too also, friendliness. You are friendly with one and all, Maitra, Mitra Bhavana. You have no strangers within you, in your life. Nobody is a stranger. Everybody is a friend indeed. Everyone is a friend. So with this attitude, one must live in the world. When you so live in the world in this way, you will not find the world as hostile as it seems to be. As it seems to be for certain eyes, it is not so. You would not be afraid to go anywhere because of your friendliness, because of your friendly attitude. So, Maitra, Karuna. Karuna is compassion. Compassion. You must have compassion for all those around you. Compassion for all those who are in, in difficulties or who are suffering. There has to be compassion. So this feeling of compassion should be there. Compassion comes out of the heart, not out of the mind. <clears throat> compassion comes out of your heart. So develop this compassion for one and all. 
It is the compassion and love which shares and which gives to everyone around is a factor, compassion, love and compassion. So, Maitra, Karuna, Mudita. And the third factor is that you should be happy in the happiness of others. Wherever you find people are happy, you also should be happy with their happiness. Just like the parents are happy with the happiness and well-being of their children. And what makes them happy is that to love. Similarly also, we should learn to train ourselves to be happy in the happiness of others, in the good fortunes of others. So wherever people have a good fortune, you are happy, with, happy for that. Wherever they have a misfortune, you are sympathetic and compassionate about it. So these are factors. And then the third, fourth factor is, of course, you find in the world too, a good many human animals also moving about. That also you know very well. They, you can't avoid them, they are also part of the world. So what do, how do you deal with them? Just be indifferent to them. Just be indifferent to them. Let them go, go their way. Let them go their way. So don't bother about it. Don't worry about all of those people. Leave them alone. Just as much as you find tigers and other things moving about in the world. So these are also human jackals <laughs> moving about in the world. And just be careful about them. That's all that you can do. Be careful. But uh, otherwise let them alone. Let them go their way. So in this way, develop an attitude by which you will be able to live your life in the world in a peaceful manner. Hmm? So lovingly we have got to live our life and lovingly perform all our actions. So when you perform all your actions lovingly, no action becomes a chore, you know. You know the word, they say it's a chore to be done. You do it distastefully. No, no, no. Everything has to be lovingly done. Lovingly done. You have to lovingly interact with one and all, lovingly interact with one and all. You should not be, one should not be harsh and rude and unkind to people. How are, how are simple and how are lowly they may be, but the nobility of a person is understood by the way they treat those who are lesser than them in whatever way they are. That's where the true nobility of a person is discerned. You can be nice to the rich and the powerful, but are you nice to those who are living <coughs> on the low side? You see, the nobility of a person is, is discerned by that. Is discerned by that. So therefore, in a loving manner, have a loving interaction with the whole world around you. If you are unkind and disrespectful towards one little creature, to that extent is your salvation blocked. <clears throat> People don't realize that. So therefore, one has to as far as possible, in a very loving manner, go through our human interactions. And graciously we have to interact with all the people around. Because this is the love which, that love within you must grow. This love within you must expand. The love which you have within your heart must bloom and blossom. You must blossom in love. Once. As usual was the practice, Lord Buddha was giving a he was giving a sermon every day. One day he had a very brief sermon, very brief sermon. He didn't speak at all. There was a flower there on the on his table. He took that flower and just showed it. And there was only one amongst his audience who smiled at him at this gesture of Lord Buddha. 
he understood, Kashyap understood the significance of it. The significance was that you too also should bloom like this flower. You should bloom in love, huh? like this flower. Now you are a bud. You are a bud now. Bloom into divinity. Bloom into divinity. That's what he meant there. As a bud bloom out. And life is giving you a life. The living of life itself is an exercise for you. Over a period of time, 20, 30, 40, 70, 80 years of time is given to you to bloom and to blossom as a beautiful flower. As a beautiful flower. So therefore, this is love. Love in action. Wherever there is love, there is a radiance there in that love. There is a love of loving radiance around. <clears throat> Just like the flower emits its fragrance too. So also, where there is love, there is a radiance of love flowing out of you. And just imagine, if millions of people were to have this radiance <coughs> of radiance of love, how would love emanate in the whole universe itself? There would be full, the world would be full of love. So therefore we have to now open our hearts and learn to embrace and accept one and all in the whole universe. Reject none. Accept one and all. And expand your love for all creatures and all beings in the whole universe. For all be beings. You embrace them. Then if you can do this, then God is only a part of this or an extension of this love. Not that you can afford to love God and hate everybody else. Or hate a section of humanity. No, it's not possible. It is basically not possible for you to dislike or hate a section of humanity and to claim and to claim and proclaim that we love God. It's not possible. It's not at all possible. So it's like uh, the fragrance of the flower saying, I only emit my fragrance to three parts of the half the room and not to the other part of the room, it's not possible. Because if you have truly, if there was truly love in your heart, it would be all around radiance, all around, embrace one and all. So when you do this, when you have this love, you will find that you have no hostility with the world around you. And nor will the world around you be hostile to you. It's both ways. Nor will you be hostile to the world. Nor will the world be hostile to you. So in this manner, one must now develop this love, this universal love for one and all beings in the whole universe. So this is love. You don't have to go to and love God separately. No, it's not possible. Basically, so you are going to learn to love here. And through this, then God also becomes an extension of this love becomes an extension. Then the fourth factor is that <coughs> you have this pr problematical mind of yours. The fourth component, which has because the, all this is part of your life, you have you require knowledge and wisdom. Then you have to live your life and perform your actions in the world. The second factor. Then the third factor is that uh, you have. Emotions and the most important emotion that you have is love. Hmm? Is love. And then the fourth aspect is that you have a mind. Now, so this mind of yours is, is the biggest cause of your human existence, a problematical mind. So, therefore, you have to overcome this mind of yours, bring it under discipline and control. And that science is the science of mind. The science of mind. You have to overcome some of the some of the ways or patterns of thinking patterns of your mind and streamline your mind and make the mind calm and placid and sensitive. Make that mind of yours. Hmm? And eventually overcome this mind itself so that you become the master of your own mind. 
instead of being the slave of your mind, you become its master. So unless you have mind mastery, well, you cannot attain salvation. So, because this mind of yours is the problem. Where is the problem? There are two things which are a problem to you. Or three things. What is the first thing which is a problem? What is the first thing which is a problem to you? Mind. Yes, of course. The, the mind is one of the problems. Mind is one of the problems. The second is, you are the problem. You are the problem to yourself. Each one is a problem to oneself. And the third factor which is a problem is your emotions. So you have emotions as a problem, your mind is a problem, and you are the problem. So all these three problems have to be resolved now. And you can resolve it. And if you can resolve this mind of yours, then all your problems will automatically subside. Huh? Your mind, your, so the minds, shall we say, dynamic, dynamic functioning of this mind, indiscipline functioning would be brought into discipline and control. So much so that a time may come when you want to think, you can think. And when you don't want to think, you don't need to think. You can keep quiet. So you must learn to mentally keep quiet. Mentally keep quiet. Now, where do you learn to mentally keep quiet? Don't tell me. Where do you learn to mentally keep quiet? In meditation. Yes, one in meditation. Secondly, secondly, where do you learn to keep quiet? In your heart sensor. When you... <coughs> sensor. When you... Yeah, when, when you... Sensor ear. Then yeah. your mind, yes. you can watch and then... Yeah. When you are living your life, <coughs> when you are living your life, <coughs> you can keep quiet. You can train yourself to keep quiet while executing your functions. Going through your actions, don't think at that time. Most of the t actions that you do are automatic. Look, driving a car is automatic. Just drive the car. Just drive the car. That's all that you have to do. When you cook your meals, just cook it. When you eat your food, just eat it. Just eat it. So by this process, what is happening is, is that you are disciplining your mind and getting into a practice of no mind. The practice of no mind, the active practice of no mind. So you're training your mind to be quiet. To be quiet. It's like telling a dog, you know, keep quiet. So similarly also, you tell your, now you impose this, impose this education on your mind itself and train your mind to keep quiet. So the whole of, the living of life itself is a training ground. You're being trained. This is where your training is taking place. Why living your life in the world? You don't have to enter an institution for that, do you? You know why you don't have to enter an institution? Because you are normal. If you are not normal, I can understand somebody entering an institution. In America, that's what they do. They get them institutionalized. Now you see? So therefore, you don't have to and live your life in this manner, calmly, calmly and quietly. So these are the four aspects. And the fifth is the cultivation of virtues, divine virtues. So all the good virtues have to be studiously and scrupulously cultivated by a person. If they are, because these are the factors which uh, disturb you. So Lord Krishna says, who is a true devotee of mine? 
in the Bhagavad Gita, he mentions it. Who is a true devotee of the Lord? You know, we use the word devotee. We use the word devotion. So there Lord Krishna is saying, the one who devotedly practices these things is a true devotee. One who practices hmm, the practice of no mind state, that is to say to keep quiet, to be mentally quiet. The one who practices performing his actions in a very calm manner and a living of life <clears throat> is a true devotee. The one who maintains who is in a state of, shall we say, state of mental equipoise and at the same time is aware of his Atman or divine nature is a true devotee of God. He's a true devotee. So true devotion means, now just see, true devotion means Devotedly be aware of your divine nature and such a person is a true devotee of mine. <clears throat> That's what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. Not to stand up there and worship. That is not the devotion that he is talking about. That's the type of devotion which is now being mentioned, which has been mentioned in... Uh, in the religious traditions, that's not the devotion that he is talking of. But here, when you are devotedly practicing all of this, you are a true devotee because you've got an intention. Your intention is to be centered in your divine nature. So therefore, to be so centered and to acquire the ability to be so centered, you will have to cultivate noble virtues, noble qualities like love, compassion, kindness, goodness, hmm? uh, overcoming anger, hatred, ill will, jealousy, envy, all of these have to be cleared out of your psychological mental stream. When you are able to do this, you are a true devotee. You are a true devotee. You are devotedly practicing these methods to become godly in nature and to abide in your God nature. And to abide in your God nature. So the combination of all of these factors put together is the science of yoga. Is a science of yoga. Now these four, which I had mentioned, is classified in a religious sense as Jnana Yoga, as Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga to do with uh, knowledge awareness that I am that. Huh? They call it as Jnana Yoga, traditionally. Then perform your actions. Just do it. With that the matter is over, the action is over, the living of life is over. They use that a very elaborate technical word called karma yoga. Disciplining and controlling your mind, they call it as raja yoga. And also, for love, they use the word bhakti yoga. But really, this is what it is. Bhakti is adoration. Adoration. But here, you are devotedly cultivating this. Then you are a true devotee. This is the real meaning of it, along with all the sublime virtues. So thus in this manner, when a person practices all of these things, there is a synthesis <coughs> of yoga, which synthetically unites or incorporates all aspects of your human existence. So really speaking, you cannot afford to miss any one of these factors. In your life, in your spiritual life, all of these factors are constituents of it because they are an integral part of your, human, of your existence. So, for correspondingly, 
you have to pay attention to every one of these and unify them into your life into your life and the most primary thing is that you acquire and you require and acquire the primary knowledge which is a which is the basis of your future function the primary correct knowledge the proper understanding which you may call it as the divine wisdom but you should require is this divine knowledge and the divine wisdom which is the basis of your future of your existence of your existence and of your spiritual life om tat sat